thanks all for coming. Today we have the pleasure to have with us Jerry Weiss. Uh, his, his talk will be the fancy talk, uh, title is Turning a Vision into Reality. And by that I understand that the vision is the applying systems engineering uh, to turn it into information enterprise. My understanding now I'm a biologist, so I don't know the details and I don't want to talk about things I don't uh, comprehend. But obviously it's all about data. Data entry, data movement, data analysis, most importantly data implementation. Jerry seems to be a very modest because when we talked about his experiences, now he has decades of experience over 20 years in system integration, system engineering, software development, air vehicle analysis. He told me about uh, flight simulation. He is a person who has spent decades with uh, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, uh, Cessna. So I bet that very many of the things that we experience, uh, even when we fly, to go places might be products of his hard work. But he seems to be too modest to admit that. Uh, without uh, further details, I will let Jerry do, uh, do his thing, and I hope you enjoy this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, my name is Jerry Weiss. Um, I grew up in the Bronx, so if I need the mic, let me know. But typically, I don't do that. Uh, I'm also getting over a cold, so if I hit the water bottle or clear my throat, please uh, accept my apologies for that. Um, so, a fancy title, uh, Turning a Vision into Reality. Um, I originally came up with a boring title because I'm an engineer. Um, and when I came to do this talk, they said, well, you know, we want to attract students, and they were right. So, I needed to come up with something a little bit better. And, and the vision is really, what does a customer or a user need? And yes, I'm going to kind of focus on information systems, um, information enterprises. And, in, and as was pointed out, the information enterprises could be anything. It could be data entry. It could be data manipulation. Uh, it could be displaying data. It could be analysis of data. And, as you know, data now is used in everything. I mean, medical teams are doing research, and uh, in my experience uh, with aerospace, there was a lot of research that, that, that was done when you're manipulating data. Uh, the simulation business had a lot of data. The uh, system stuff that we did at, at Lockheed and at Vencor uh, Corporation was a lot of data dealing with the intelligence uh, community. And they're all data driven there. So this has a broad application. It, it's not tied to a specific facet of, of, of engineering. So great, so you're an enterprise system engineer. What kind of questions might you get? Now I indicated that I came from the Bronx, so I am a Yankee fan. So, if I wanted to have something, or as my wife likes to say, if there was only a device that would tell me what years the Yankees won the World Series, and I need the answer in two seconds, okay, that's something that may be posed to an enterprise systems engineer to do an analysis and to do, and to do some work on. Um, another thing is, you can have an enterprise that's made up of a lot of different components, otherwise it wouldn't be an enterprise. And they can be coming from different companies. Company A, Company B, Company C can be building different aspects of this enterprise. And how do you communicate this vision to different companies? How do you communicate that vision to uh, different vendors, to what do you need from them? What do they need to provide? How do we integrate all this back together? How do we verify that we got what we were looking for? So those are kinds of the things that an enterprise systems engineer 
uh, would get confronted with. And there'll be some other examples in there. But one of the examples that I like to use, and, and there's someone in the audience that I've worked there for a lot of years, and he knows, I know he knows I use this analogy a lot. Um, you got a jigsaw puzzle, 500 pieces, 1,000 pieces, you dump it on the table. First thing you do, you turn the box over, and you look at the picture, and you say, okay, what can I find? Well, the enterprise systems engineer, and the way I look at it is, they're the keeper of the top of the puzzle box. They have the big picture. They have that vision. They got it from some, a customer, possibly, but they're the ones that are going to be the safeguarding of that, of the top of the puzzle box, as I like to call it. So, enough of that. One of the first things I learned when I went into industry was, as an engineer, I went into engineering because I didn't like English. I didn't want to write. I was a math person. They sat down, and they said, you got to write. And I said, oh, I'm in trouble. And they, I went to somebody and he said, writing and engineering is very simple. Don't even have to remember three things. Tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them what you told them, no, tell them and then tell them what you told them. Well, this is step one. I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you. So, this covers this stuff. The first couple of bullets, uh, the first three bullets really talk about one of the values, introducing it, first three or four bullets, we'll talk about that. The next two bullets is, okay, great, I have those concepts, now how do I implement them in a, in a development process? And when I say development, development includes operations, includes maintenance, it's a, it's a bigger life cycle than to, to just making it. And then I have a couple different examples that I'd like to uh, discuss with you. And the word was discuss, so be careful, you may be asked a question. Okay. So why am I here? What's the goal of this presentation? Well, for a lot of years, I was a manager, um, and I would be hiring people. And you go into the interview process, and you have a candidate for maybe an hour, give or take a few minutes. And you got to assess the individual, whether they're a strong candidate. And you also got to sell your company, because I'm sure they got another interview tomorrow company XYZ. And I tell them, well, we do systems engineering. We do enterprise engineering. And I can't tell you any more, that, more than that because we do it for the intelligence community and that's the way it is. And they sit there and they look at you like a deer in the headlights. They have no idea what you're talking about. So you start to explain a little bit and they, they, they start to get it. But I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if a student had an opportunity during their academic career to at least be exposed to this discipline, this part of engineering. So, I'm here. But what's the goal of an enterprise systems engineer? Um, basically, it's to make sure the customer gets what they want. They want to get it with certain capabilities and functionality. They want to get it in a certain period of time, and they want to get it for X number of dollars. And that's a three-legged stool. And that's a tricky problem sometimes to, to manage so that all three come out at the same time, nice and even. Uh, so how do you accomplish this, this goal <coughs> of giving the customer what they want? painting that vision. Well, they can take the role of a design agent. And a design agent, and I'm not going to read these, but a design agent basically takes that vision, translates that into language that developers and designers understand, which if you're familiar with the thing, it turns out you're writing statements to help them understand how they want this future enterprise to work. It could be a, a concept of operations, it could be requirements, it could be any, any, any number of different ways. And they are also are working with the designers to make sure that that vision comes to reality. They're answering questions. They're, they're helping them become uh, successful. Uh, they, act, they also do this possibly as an integration agent. 
So you got different components being done by different companies, and they're all happy in their little corner because they're in Northern California or Colorado or upstate New York. And oh, by the way, we're going to integrate all of this stuff and King of Prussia. I worked on a, a Tomahawk weapon control system. The pieces coming from all over the place, nine different vendors brought their stuff together, and we had to integrate it. And, you know, you have to know the right scope of how you want to test this. You need to know what the different pieces need to do. You need to help them know that and then you need to be looking at that. And then there's gonna be problems. Company A, and, and, and something's not working right. Company A and Company B's pieces are on either end of this interface. And Company A is saying, Company B screwed this up. Company B is saying, Company A screwed this up. And you become the guy in the striped shirt and the whistle, and you become the referee, and you say, the problem is really here. Or if we did this and they did that, we can resolve the issue. So you become that person again, keeping the vision and uh, making sure that the customer gets what they what they want. All right. So why is it important? Well, I talked a lot about customer satisfaction. Uh, you're minimizing differences. Okay reading all of that, I have the, or I bolded the unintended consequences. So there was an example where someone made uh, an electronic healthcare system and they kept the records electronically, but they didn't iron out all the interfaces. So the billing department never received the fact that someone came into the ER, for example. Or the lab, even worse, the lab results for patient ABC went to CYD because the metadata was screwed up and the interface didn't work according to plan and they had these unintended consequences. So looking at the whole system is what the enterprise systems engineer's job is. All right, don't worry, I'm not reading all of this. <laughs> uh, I am going to point out one thing. Capability can be, it can consist of functionality and, and performance. So, what do I mean by that? So, can anybody take a guess at something that could be considered, and it doesn't have to be an information thing, uh, a system? You know? Got all these great definitions up here. What what could be a system or an enterprise, I should say? Yeah. I'm sorry? Maybe a referral, a referral program for all different types of professionals. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's got to sort, it's got to, it's got to understand key metadata, you know, for that. It's got to funnel that based on some decision logic on you know where that person or things you know need to go. Absolutely. Think even bigger. You're out. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't say what you know. Uh, think about the, the government decides it wants to build a brand new fighter. All right? The F 35 is a brand new fighter. It lifts off conventionally, it lifts off vertically, it can land vertically. It's got all kinds of systems. It's got to support a pilot. He's got to be able to breathe. He's got to be able to, you know, you have the, you have all this equipment in there that has to be cool. Lots of things going on. What about a car? A car is a good one. All right, so you got a car, and a car can have a lot of components and subsystems in it. It's got a climate control system, it's got a speed control system, it's got a sound system, it's got, and now it can park itself system, I don't know what that's called. I guess it's good, because parallel parking always used to be the thing that got you on your driving test. Um, and those systems, take the climate control system, um, they got 
components. They got an air conditioning system, they got a heating system, it's got a thermostat that says when to switch from one to the other because the driver set a particular temperature they want to keep the car at. Or, if it's like a lot of cars, and if it's like my family, mine's set on 68, and my wife's is set on 78, and, uh, you know, it's kind of somewhere in the middle, probably. What about a capability? What would be a capability for a car? That's a that's a function and a performance. You know, it's got to go forward. It's got to go backwards. It's got to, you know, uh, got to stop when the car is going 30 miles an hour. It's got to stop at 500 feet. Those are all capabilities. So, like I said, this is not limited to where this can be used. This can be used in a lot of places. Okay. So. All right, enterprise systems, engineering concepts. All right, this, this part I will read a little bit of. The application of systematic, disciplined, quantifiable approach to development, operation, and maintenance. And maintenance, particularly in software things, is where historically 70 to 80% of your cost is. But when you first release something, iPhone 4 came out and they kept making 5, 6, 6S, 7, etc., etc. That's where all your money gets eaten up. Um, typically, it's done with large systems or systems that are being built, enterprise being built with a lot of people. Again, we're the key part of the puzzle box and we're identifying where there's risk. Because remember, we talked about cost and we talked about schedule. Nothing can eat cost and schedule faster than taking a lot of risk without knowing you're doing it and trying to mitigate it. Any questions? Oh, by the way, with questions, just jump in. Don't wait for the end because I'll forget where I was. So, okay. And don't worry, I am not reading all of these. And there's no test at the end, so you guys are good. Um, these values can also be looked at as kind of characteristics of what an enterprise systems engineer can be asked to do. Typically, any one person won't do all of these, but as a whole, those things were that, that easily be done. So. Again, um, figure out this thing. Okay, understand the customer need and, and stating the problem. That's the vision. Got to make sure you understand the vision. Got to make sure the vision is getting to the people that are building the components of the enterprise. That's real big. That's many times in the form of requirements, uh, and user stories. Uh, Take your pick on the technology that, that you're talking about. That's that's, a, that's important to know. Um, the risk management prioritization. You know, if you got to do a lot of things, you can't do. You only have a limited workforce, and maybe there's a technology uh, constraint that you got to do this before you do that. How do you prioritize that stuff? Uh, design reviews. Whether and this will this will vary with the design with the development method that is selected. Sometimes they're very formal, and the waterfall method, I'll talk about that very briefly. Sometimes they're informal as an agile, um, but it's all there to help. Those are all tools in your box to help the customer get what they want, to help to fulfill that vision. Jerry, I'm sorry, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to, you to forget. So, based on your experience, yeah. uh, this is the question I had. Is it possible that the customer may come up with a project, an idea that currently is impossible to realize? Mm -hmm. So, they will come to you and ask to the company, and they will ask, we want this to be done. 
and you realize that based on the reality that we live in, uh, the real know-how and the, uh, technology, this is impossible. And what do you, what do you tell the customer? How do you manage? Well, if this is a real case. If it's an external customer, you know, I mean, the answer is going to be that you don't want, you can make it so that it's so prohibitive to do this that, you cost know, cost-wise, time-wise, the technology is not there. It's not realistic to, to do this. How you actually phrase that will depend on whether it's an internal person making this request or organization or it's an external one because, you know, you know, they may come back and say, okay, you know, you, you don't want to alienate them so that they don't come back again with something else. You've always got to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, if, if it's a company like Lockheed and you're dealing with the federal government, uh, you don't want to make, you don't want to present that in a way that you belittle them. Right. You want to present that in a way that we're just not there yet from a technology perspective. Or if you do this, there's a lot of risk and a lot of cost, and I can't guarantee the schedule. They're willing to do that, okay. You know, or you can suggest something else and say, we can take this on as, a, as an R&D project, and we can right. try to mature the technology, and then we can come back and, and look at incorporating it into a real world situation. Right. So there, there are different ways that, that you can do that. But one of the things about this is, it's a soft engineering skill. I mean, it's not brutal calculus and physics and equations. It's, there's a lot of human interaction. Communication is really key uh, with that, which is why it's amazing I lasted 40 years. <laughs> uh, An observation. Huh? An observation. Yes. I, I, I think how do you define the problem has a significant influence on what alternatives you consider. Einstein is basically say spend 90% of your time thinking about the problem and once you truly understand it, 10% is actually solve it. Mm -hmm. And all too often, you know, there's false starts because people don't recognize it. what is the real problem we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. yes. so I'll give you a, a slightly dated but a very similar example was I'm, I'm reading a book about the skunk works. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's a part of Lockheed Aircraft Corporation. They made the U-2, they made uh, the SR-71, if you're familiar with aircraft. Uh, and one of the things that they, they were doing, they had just finished the, the U-2 spy plane, and uh, they've been doing mods to it, whatever, and they were taking pictures over Russia, and they noticed that the Russians were doing a lot of, it seemed to be a lot of work with liquid nitrogen. And they thought they were building a liquid nitrogen airplane. They weren't. They were actually building a rocket for Sputnik, but they thought it was an airplane. <laughs> so the government went to, to the Skunk Works and said, I want you to build us a liquid, ni a liquid hydrogen airplane. Sorry, a hydrogen yes, airplane. Right. And um, they went off and they, they tried it. And uh, about halfway through the time that they were given, they said, there's no way in heck we can do this with technology at the States today. And they ended up telling the government that and giving them the rest of the money back. And that in itself is a rarity, giving the government <laughs> money back. Yes? Take your building example, and I have my, my friend who's my conscious over here has a saying, everything's connected. And, and he's absolutely right. Um, if you're the architect and um, you don't talk to the folks that are doing 
the internal plumbing, you may not leave enough room in the conduits put aside for, to run pipes. You know, and now you got a problem. You know, because now you got to move some walls. Now, it's one thing to move them when it's a drawing or it's a CAD or whatever, and you know, you're you're in that analysis mode that that uh, Charlie mentioned a second ago. Because you may not have thought of everything when you first started analyzing the problem, but as you start to, you know, look at it more completely, you're right. You gotta you gotta listen and talk to these other people. Now, friends, coming with that, and the other thing is, is I found it helpful since I was a previous I was a software developer before I became an enterprise systems engineer. So I kind of understood what those guys had to do and what they needed. So you try to make sure that you're giving them that information so that they can be successful. Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't. But, but that's a great lead in to a development life cycle of various stages. And let me. Before I kind of walk through it, there are, I already presented, represented one with, with four stages. Analysis, which we brought up as the first one. Design, implementation, and operation. Um, here's a case where the user could be customers, it could be outside your company, it could be, um, you know, you, you survey people who bought the last telephone and now they got you know, you're thinking about making an upgrade or what do they really want. Uh, could be people that bought cars in the last 10 years. Could be the government who bought, you know, uh, the last fighter and now they found out that, um, well, I'll give you a little story about how clients have changed. But technology changes. So now, you know, I need something that can do even more. Um, you know, they had radars and they were able to see our aircraft coming and they had anti-aircraft missiles and it would, you know, it would be a bad situation. But if you developed stealth technology or implemented stealth technology, you could be successful. So there's that analysis. What really is the problem? What are we really trying to do? Um, you get the system teams together. You define the components, the architecture. The performance requirements, we pointed out before, I got to stop within 500 feet, 30 miles an hour. That's going to help you size the braking system you need. Uh, and the con ops, sometimes that's left out, but that's how is the system intended to be used? You know, what, how does it work? Because you get behind the wheel of a car today, you take somebody who maybe hasn't driven a car in 25 years put them in front of a car today, before they used to have a shift to go into gear and a, and a little handle on the side for directionals and that's all they had. Now you got your windshield wipers on there and you got the speed control on there and you got the sound system in the middle of the steering wheel and you can put your phone on mute and oh my god a phone in the car how can you do that? You know, so you got all of these things how are you the ergonomics of it? You know, how does all that play? Because everything's connected. All right, so you decide that you need more than one component, so I, due to space, only put down two, but I pulled it in. Um, you do the design process. And, and in the next slide or so, I'll talk about some of the development methods. You start to integrate things, build it up to the full system, you put it into operations, and I guarantee you're gonna start to get feedback. But one of the things that you need to do through these different things, through these different phases, through these different stages, is you need to be talking with the consumer, the person ordering this, the person who's paying for it. Uh, what do you need? All right. Can I ask a, a question? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, how is it different for a company like Apple, where they design stuff that never existed before. I mean, they, they created their customers and their demand for the iPod and the iPhone because I mean, most people didn't even have that as a, as a concept. 
No, but somebody had the idea that, gee, I want to well, take my music with me. Mm -hmm. And I don't want, I want it so that I can just put it in my, my little pocket. Or, um, you know, gee, I want to put a camera in a phone. Exactly. Let me tell you, that was, that was a yeah, great yeah. idea for people. It was horrible for me. <laughs> because once they put a camera in my phone, actually before that, but once they put it in there for sure, working in the intelligence community, they did not like the idea of you bringing your phone in because it had a camera. And you could be doing things you shouldn't be doing. It's so, like a camera in the classroom, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes? And I remember asking one of my sons one time, where did that thought even came from? Yeah. A camera and a phone? And he just mentioned that in Japan, that everywhere people had phones and cameras. And, and so that was, just, again, the idea planted and then of course then they make it a need as opposed to a want but that's marketing. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> yeah. But and you're I, right. And you're and actually, I can't help it. All all your talking to I just keep all this stuff. I keep thinking about Walt Disney and how he had the vision and nothing was there. Nothing. So that's right. Swampland in Florida. And so I mean, he's my hero because he <laughs> just said, let's do all of this and let's get it all together and there it is. And and he calls them imagineers because right. they imagine it all and then no, you, exactly. you're right. They're doing similar processes exactly. until when, by the time they think about it, till the time they invite people into, yeah. you know, to and being come and visit. And the unintended consequences that you have. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. This part is the, okay. The, the methods. So I'm going to talk very briefly about three methods, there are probably a whole bunch more, but these were the three I had some experience with. Um, systems Engineering V or Waterfall Method, Spiral and, and Agile. Uh, from a time perspective, the Waterfall or the Systems Engineering V came around the early 1980s. Uh, it got the name Systems Engineering V because they would do this analysis from ideas or, or, or needs that, that existed. Then they would do, then they would, that would kind of end, if you will. Then it would, they would define the requirements that it needed to do. Then it would talk about the architecture. Then it would talk about a preliminary design. And then a critical design was a detailed design. Then you'd actually start to implement code or hardware or something. And now it start coming back up to V. Well, you know, you start to test the, the pieces together, you integrate some more of it together till you get the whole enterprise together, and then you put it in the op. So it was this imaginary V-shaped process that uh, went on. So that's how it got the term systems engineering V. Um, it was very formal. The, the, the reviews could have hundreds of people in a, in a conference room. And it's very, you dry running these presentations for weeks ahead of time. Uh, the requirements were frozen. And sometimes that's a problem. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example in a second. The other thing is it tended to be used on large systems. So it would take anywhere from 18 to 24 months, and that was kind of quick for something through the systems engineering V. Technology today changes every 12 to 18 months. Uh, but they use that kind of method when you're doing, uh, when they did the Joint Strike Fighter. All right, new airplane, okay? Took seven to 10 years before from when they got awarded the contract to that sucker started flying. It became an operational squad. Okay. I'll give you a story about the B-2. B-2 got uh, released in 1981, and it was, so its primary mission was to deliver weapons at high altitude. About two or three years into the process, they figured out that even though it was a stealth airplane, there could be some radars that could pick it up, and we want to change its concept of operation and we wanted to fly low level. All right, well, that does a lot to an airplane. It, it kills your fuel consumption. It also 
puts a lot more stress on the airplane. They had to totally redesign the airplane. So changing requirements can have a big impact. It took them two, three years to recover from that. That's in a company that's employing 7,000 people. You can do the math, it's a lot of money. Um, but there is a place for it, there is a place for it. So then Spiral, they came along in the mid 80s and it really said, okay, we ought to do some prototyping. We ought to check out some things. Maybe we can get some new technology in there. And they would do these prototypes, and then they, once they kind of figured out that this was the piece that we wanted to do in this spiral, knowing that we'll do several spirals to get to the very end, uh, they, uh, they would then go through a more rigorous design process, similar to, to the waterfall, but to a lesser degree. The Agile came along mostly in software in the 90s, but it's been been picked up by other industries in the 2000, 2010s. Um, much shorter timeline, it delivers software every 24 weeks. So you're constantly reprioritizing, your requirements can be changed or more frequently. You can do things with that. There's a place in, in the world for that too, except we're still learning how to build big systems using that technique efficiently. All right. So, any questions on, yeah, so I know it's a lot, but I just want to expose the names so that if you run into it somewhere down the road. Yes? So, this is just a different question. I'm just sure. listening to what you're saying. Does anybody, did, has anybody ever, I assume you worked at Lockheed or someplace like mm -hmm. that. Did, did any, does anybody ever come from the social, uh, arena and say we have this problem with homelessness or this or that and ask you to take a scientific solution and help them make out analyze that model design it implement it so that you can solve a real life people problem um, they should be doing that. they should be doing that sometimes other industries will come to a Lockheed besides the government, you know, besides the defense or intelligence industries. Um, and in fact, they try to diversify, to broaden their corporate portfolio to, to some of that. Um, problem is, is sometimes this is not very inexpensive. Um, but so do you but we do get into more crowd, one? you know that TV show where, you know, uh, I forgot the name of it, but the guy puts stuff out on the net, and, you know, all the crowdsourcing you know, is going on. That type of stuff is feeding in to uh, some of the, the things that people are doing. So it's, the source of information is is changing, but all this these principles apply, like you said, to so many different areas. Uh, it's not just, like the title said, an information system. But they're not effectively used. Yeah. Exactly. Because every time you do something, it's connected with everything else that's right. and the implications. Yeah. And, th and that's why you really have to think of the nature of the problem. Yeah. You know, wh whether you're you know, creating a new city, a new school system, when you start going through all the pieces of the puzzle, it's pretty complex. Yeah. It's like a balloon. You push it in here, it's going to bulge over there. Right. Uh, you know, so, so let me get to a couple of the examples. And see if, oh, here's another question. I'm sorry. So. Yeah, that, would, that was my question, actually, an example of this. <laughs> I was just wondering what well, you example. think they cut things up, you know, small enough that national prioritization is really important because you need to have the infrastructure to do something before you can do something else. You're not going to build an aircraft carrier in, in 24 week increments, but you can develop software um, like that and um, the release trains, uh, as they call them, uh, can define the analysis, like Charlie was talking about before, needs to be done so you know what needs to happen, then you can prioritize it, then you can start to build it in chunks, and then you can start testing it, and then hopefully once you get enough of it that it makes sense, you can start to beta test it and have you know, a sample of people start to utilize it, and you get the <laughs> feedback, and then that can get into the prioritization system. You don't have to wait for the whole thing. 
part of the concept of it. So I figured I'd try a university example. <laughs> Living dangerously. So um, college, uh, which has one campus, all of a sudden due to some very nice individual gets a large sum of money and uh, they can uh, go ahead and they're going to expand their main campus into a number of satellite campuses with the main campus. Okay. And they find that they have a library on the main campus, they have a single library, and the hours are kind of limited and there's not a whole lot online and it's really tough for the students because some of them you know, work daytime jobs and come to classes in the evening and accessibility and it could be in upstate New York where it snows all the time, you don't want to trek to the library, you want to do it in your dorm room. So they want to provide a better system, and that's what the future is. They want to update their facilities, they want to be able to search, they want to be able to read, download, save on to a local uh, machine, let's say, and print out things from all the different campuses where the libraries can be or will be. A um, little asterisk over here is a, is a plug for my backup. I have one of the slides in the backup. It shows different uh, industries, different examples of power grid, healthcare, other things where there's write, uh, writings on doing this type of engineering in, in those areas. So, okay. So, back to the analysis piece. Most, you know, very important piece, not the most important piece. You got to analyze what you got. You got a limited amount of time, and they obviously have a limited amount of money. So they're going to make the most use of what is called COTS commercial off the shelf material. Um, they want to minimize new development. They want to see if there's a library system that they can either purchase, borrow, steal, whatever. I did not mean literally steal. Uh, I don't want to get in trouble. So, and they also decided that they want to do this in, in two uh, stages. They want to revamp the main campus first, and then apply that to the, to the satellite campus as opposed to doing everything at once, and then having to constantly upgrade everything at once. They want to get the first round of upgrades incorporated to what they put into the satellites the first time, the first release. And they decided to use Agile. They want to have quick releases for this. Yeah. Okay. So, in the interest of time, <laughs> since I'm running out, um, these are some of the questions that, that they would have to look at. What's the criteria for success? What do the students want? What does the faculty need from, from this? What are the capabilities? And uh, how can I make sure the risk is low enough so that I can accomplish the vision? Right. So these are some of the, this just charts very similar to the one before, but it, it highlights some of the things that the uh, enterprise systems engineer would be focusing on. And we talked about knowing what the problem is, knowing when you're done. That's a good question. Many times you don't know when you're done. You know, when do I declare victory? Uh, what's the prioritization? What do I want to put into the different releases? What, what's the scope of the testing? I'm not saying you're not doing these other things, but these are, in my view, some of the bigger things. Managing and designing interfaces, huge. Never given enough credit, not enough energy. All right, I don't have the answer for this. I left that to you guys. So I'm going to go to the next example. All right, this chart is kind of a refresher. We really talked about the design agent and the integration agent. We're the keepers of the big pictures. But what if systems don't think of themselves as part of an enterprise? So let me go through this example. And the example for this is an emergency communications enterprise. We just had all these hurricanes, right? Not too long ago. So some poor guy decided to drive through it, made the mistake, and now he's stuck. So he gets out and he gets on his cell phone and he calls 911. 
right? So the 911 call goes to a command center, right? They got to answer the thing, they got to figure out some information about him. They don't know really where he is because the command center is on the other side of the state. Pennsylvania has five state police 911 centers. So the odds of being next to one may be small, so they may not know what the local weather is right outside the window. So what they decide to do is they're going to send an, uh, uh, a drone out, a UAV, to see what's going on. So they contact the, the UAV controller. He's, he's hundreds of miles away, so he has to send commands to the UAV to see where he is and what his situation really is and what kind of help does he need. So now that information is going out to the UAV, the command, the information that the camera sees comes back to the command center, and the command center says, this guy needs a helicopter. Okay? Now, how many systems do you see up there? One and one? I got about six. You know, there's a cell phone, there's a command center, UAV, which has a controller and, and the vehicle and the comms, the rescue vehicle, and guess what? When you look at the what the if you're if you're the township or the, the state that wants to build this, unless you've got a lot of money, you ain't building all of this new. This is mostly an integration problem. You're reusing things that exist. That call center may exist, but may not have your township. You know, hooked up to it. So, and that's him getting saved. <laughs> so, if you look at what what's needed, you gotta you gotta know what you need. You want to reuse that. You want to make sure that the radio frequencies match. That the helicopter can talk to the control center. You know, if you if you go back. You know, there's a lot of chances where these interfaces may not be compatible. All right, so just kind of wrapping this up. We're the keeper in a puzzle box, as I like to say it. Um, you know, knowing what the what the mission is, knowing what the customer needs are, how to satisfy them looking at the development and the risk management. And you can see systems engineering has a lot of different aspects to it, and it could apply to everything. And in a nod to my friend, everything is connected. Um, I have a bunch of backup stuff. I don't intend to go through it because time is, is running out on me. But um, the school has it. Ever choose to want to see some more details about any of this? Uh, you can also get a hold of me. They have my contact information. I'd be happy to help out if there's any questions. So, with that, I'll leave it there. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. I didn't do that good of a job. <laughs> I think so. Okay, so that's fine. Yes. Um, you spent your background with um, software? Um, yeah, I spent some time doing that. So, what kind of education did a person gather to Well, the path I took actually, I went to a two year college in New York uh, at Farmingdale, State University of Farmingdale. Uh, went up to Buffalo and then went out to California and worked for the government out there. Did mostly hardware uh, testing, but started to get into some of that. Really got into software when I moved from desert to Kansas. And you start to write, I write programs for takeoff distances uh, on airplanes. So it was really using the computer at that, you know, you got to go back the 1970s. Uh, so we were using that as really a high powered flight rule, a way to do iterative calculations, uh, and 
had very little formal software training. A lot of brute force, uh, finesse was not my strong suit there. Um, but I did 15 years of doing flight simulation, and that's all software. And that's where I learned object-oriented design, that's where I learned the different structured programming, object-oriented design, other things. So it was through on-the-job training, really, that I did that, and courses that you took on, that either companies offered or the local colleges offered that I, that, that I took. Um, obviously, a computer science type of person would get some of this, but they always, they're, they're more, as I used to say, they're worried about the ones and zeros. I was worried about wings and things, because um, <laughs> I did flight part of the simulation. So I was worried about the equations of motion. I was worried about that stuff. Um, but it was kind of hodgepodge there. I think universities probably give, I mean, I know they give a lot more uh, projects and, and computers are dealt, you know, are integrated so much into the learning experience now in, in schools that they should be getting a fair amount of, of that using different apps, using different things I, I would think. But it's not just using them, it's knowing, you know, how to marry them with sometimes if you need to. That, that's where it gets a little dicier and what standards did they use? And, you know. Um, and there's another thing about the standards, because you can say I, I used the standard but I didn't use it the same way used you used it <clears throat> and how you interpreted it and now you still got a problem. I didn't nearly answer your question, but I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> he said Mosley was on the job. Mosley was on the job, right? In my particular case. Yeah. <laughs> present him with a certificate of appreciation for this excellent talk, as well as to invite Cindy Fortunato, who represents person, uh, and she will uh, present Jerry with a check of $250,000. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must have saw the movie Saint. It's gone. <laughs> when, when the eyeball fell. Yeah, Where's the keys? Thank you very much, Jerry. Oh, thank Jerry. you. It's all connected, right? That's right. That's how we'll remember it. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. This is great. Thanks all for coming. Thank you. thank you all for showing up. I appreciate it. Thank you for the questions. That was helpful.